Hello folks, it's World War II TV, it's still a medics week, I can't believe it's flown by this week, it's only my show to go tomorrow on Saturday from Angerville, but it's, yeah, been really fast going. Weather's been terrible outside, so I haven't been able to do much, I've been inside doing more research work, so that's great. So, today's subject, uh, British, we're talking at the British Airborne Medics, so the role of medics within the Airborne Division, 6th Airborne, 1st Airborne, and my guest tonight, he's been on World War II TV before. He was in talking about the commando operations in Norway in 1940. Uh, prolific author. I think he's 11 or 12 books now, something like that, maybe more. He'll correct me in a minute. Um, former medic himself in the British Army. So uh, that's quite cool. So Neil Cherry, wine author, veteran. Good evening, Neil. How are you? Hello, Paul. How are you? Uh, 16 for you. I'll, I'll 16 you books. Forehead next time. 16 was the last count. Okay, 16. Whatever. It's more, more than a thousand, less than 20. Good. So you, you you were a medic when you were in yeah. the Army. So, you know, I don't know whether you've been following the shows we've done this week, but the thing is that there's a peculiar kind of person becomes a medic. And I mean that in a complimentary way. It's, it's, it's a different kind of role than being an engineer or a sniper or a truck driver. So to kind of conclude, concluding what we've been talking about this week, what kind of person do you think kind of becomes a medic? <laughs> Good question. Well put. Um, I suppose in my case, the easy answer is I got sucked into it in the recruiting office. Okay. Um, like every like every other thing, um, I was determined I wasn't going to join the infantry. Put it that way. Um, and and just to digress, I think and to sort of answer your question, um, I'm sure you're aware um, the recruiting sergeants, although they probably won't admit to this, they have certain quotas to fill, for want of a better yeah. word, and. My good friend, um, who I usually go out drinking with on a Friday night, which I've had to forego this week for the Wharton and Freckleton PRA, Parachute Regimental Association, weekly meeting in the Clifton Arms, my good friend, Frog Barlow. Um, he helps train up a few young guys to get them fit to go in the army. And we always try and tell them, don't go into the infantry. We try and steer them towards, for example, the Royal Navy, the engineers. And, and we always say to the guys, if we can't go with them, when you get in the recruiting office and the sergeant says, I have no vacancies in that unit, would you like to join the Queen's Lancashire Regiment or whatever? We just say, no, I'm sorry, I'll go and find another recruiting office. And unfortunately, in my case, I got sucked into it. I suppose I had no real perception of um, what I wanted to do, um, but I was a bit of a bad boy in my youth, and I think we'll just better leave it at that. Um, and I got sucked into joining the Royal Army Medical Corps. And to be honest with you, it's one of those corps where we almost get everywhere. Um, well, in fact, we do get everywhere. There's a commando branch. There's an airborne branch. Um, you can get detached duties to like infantry companies, which is what has happened with the parachute battalions and the air landing battalions. They had, I'm, I'm, I'm already started to talk. If you like. They had one medical officer and about 20 other ranks in all of the battalions. So you do get almost to see the world. And it's not like being you're coming out. I mean, although I came out, um, I finished my time as um, uh, what was known as a combat medical technician class one, which was the top of the tree. Um, and it didn't do me any harm, although it didn't work in Civvy Street. Those qualifications in those days didn't walk across to Civvy Street. And I never did another, you know, and I didn't get a job in, the, in a medical world when I came out of the army. Um, but it didn't do me any harm. I qualified as an MBC instructor, uh, first aid, helicopter handling, Soviet skills, did all, you know, and we did and did a lot of things. Um, and I think that was the beauty of being in the medics. You weren't necessarily always tied down to um, one particular unit or one particular role. Yeah, but there were chance the to other, do different things, yeah. And the other thing was, of course, you could sometimes work in it. You sometimes en ended up working in a civvy hospital. And what's, what do you find in a civvy hospital? Lots of nurses. Indeed. <laughs> That's, that, let's leave it at that. So, as with all my guests, you prepared a, a quite a lengthy PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to go through the formation of creation of or uh, running of and battles of the um, Red Berets and Red Crosses. So I'll hand over to you. And when I have questions for you or when anyone watching has a question, I will dive in with a question. So, um, yeah. Please when do. you need me to move on the slide, just say next slide. And by the way, folks, some, uh, thank you to some of my friends, Brian Parfit, Richard Townsend. They've let me use a couple of photos from every few years. There's a brilliant 
reenactment, living history recreation of a hospital in Oosterbeek in Arnhem of volunteers Ooh. who set up. Excuse me, uh, stop there. There is no such thing. There were no hospitals at Arnhem. As I, I, I mean, I, 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 you know what I mean. A, you, a, I will prove to you in a moment. Okay, you know what I mean. A yeah, recreation I of mean, a yeah. medical facility. Okay, yeah. yes. Thank you so much. So they've allowed me to use some of their photos. That's great. Yeah. So off we go then. So yeah. um, I'll jump in when I need to. Thank you. So we can go to the next one straight away. Thank you. Um, so just a quick uh, quick uh, intro into the role and history of the Royal Army Medical Corps. As you can see, we're quite a young corps, formed in 19, sorry, 1898, and obviously we're out in South. Oh, my God. I've, I've just lost comms, Paul. No, I've still got you. No, I've got you. It's all right. I did something there. I don't know what I did, but I've done it. Anyway, um, obviously, the uh, Corps saw its baptisms of fire in Boer War, South Africa, turn of the century. During the Great War, as you say, the Corps drew to 180,000 all ranks. Uh, and as I always say to anyone else um, in the army who's having a go at the medics, two of the only three men to win the VC twice are from the Royal Army Medical Corps, and not many corps and regiments can say that. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the Second World War, the changing nature and shape of warfare gave the REMC problems which they needed to solve, commando and airborne operations. So if we could just crack on. Normally speaking, um, this is the, the uh, casualty evacuation chain that the British Army has used for many years. So you have the point of wounded in the front line. The regimental aid post would be um, with the company or battalion and infantry battalion normally now then you have a what's known as a field ambulance section is the next link in the chain through to a main dressing station which is where um, the first real treatment is going to be um, caused those two steps field ambulance section main dressing station are run by a unit called a field ambulance the next link in the chain they're not really suited for surgery shall we say a field ambulance as i'll come on to shortly then you go to something known and this is a real known unit as a casualty clearing station this is the place where surgery can realistically first be carried out and then the next link in the chain is the field or general hospital so as you can see the uh, if you ever say there was a hospital a field hospital at arnhem they were miles away and they were normally back in england or on the coast certainly in the first world war for example or on the coast of france like uh, il tarples and boulogne and so on so then the other thing is as well as the casualty evacuation chain you 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 do what we call the, the word that's come into use quite uh, a lot now in the civvy street and certainly from casualty the tv program triage yeah. and that's where you sort the casualties into their order of priorities p1 p2 and p3 so um just a quick word here p1s the priority ones casualties requiring urgent resuscitation surgery severe bleeding uh respiratory difficulties obstruction open chest wounds abdominal wounds and the aim is to get those casualties on an operating table within six hours of being wounded priority twos early surgery possible resuscitation multiple wounds compound fractures large wounds and muscles and the idea is to get those operated on as soon as possible after six hours and then p3 is all the others um so if we could quickly move on yeah so that's a brief look at the uh, role of the RAMC on the ground, etc. And now we'll come into some of these notable dates in the early history of the Airborne Forces and the Airborne Medical Services. So you're probably all aware of the June 1940 memo for the Airborne Corps. Then in early 1941, while they were still sorting themselves out, volunteers were asked for a parachute medical unit. And in April 1941, 16th Parachute Field Ambulance was officially formed. And... And then in October, the Airborne HQ and the chief doctor, for want of a better word, this guy called Colonel Austin Eager was appointed as the first assistant director of medical services. Then you come along in October 41, although slightly out of sync there, as you can see, the 31st Independent Infantry Brigade, which was training as a mountain brigade or mountainous warfare, was told it was an air landing unit and its medical support 181. Uh, field ambulance was now told it was an air landing one they would all go in gliders and they would be known as 181 air landing field ambulance and then february 1942 the first operation that the airborne medics take part in operation biting and we will say a few words about that 
uh, in a few slides time, hopefully. So we can crack on again. So here we are. Problems for the airborne medics, as you can see, likely to be behind enemy lines at the start of the operation, unable to evacuate casualties until reached by our ground forces, no surgical facilities normally in a field ambulance. What equipment can be taken? Because obviously um, a field, a normal ground based field ambulance would have ambulances and lorries and tents and all the paraphernalia of that. Um, to move around in. Where do the men come from and how to move casualties from the point of wounding to a medical facility, given that we couldn't parachute uh, vehicles in, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem number one, no surgical facilities. And that was overcome by expanding the role of a field ambulance to include two field surgical teams as they went on. Crack on. Um, and then the equipment can be taken trial and error in the early days. Um, I always remember, um, I did speak to a guy who worked in the Q, QM department, the quartermaster department at uh, 16 in the early days. And they basically laid all the equipment that they had been given out on one side of a massive Nissan hut and then decided that the stuff that they definitely, definitely needed would be moved over to the other side of the uh, hut on everything that was left behind. They said, we can do without that. So it lead, they started, if you like, to do in a light scale cat. Um, and then, of course, um, relying on air supply from resupply from the air and that when the horse of glider came along each unit was allocated even if they were a parachute one and i will touch on that later on as we go on um was allocated gliders to bring equipment supplies and transport um don don and sugar packs talk about those in a moment um those two were developed for the airborne forces and then there's the use of trolleys so we can quickly crack on again so hopefully you can just about make out that ladies and gentlemen that is your classic airborne folding trolley as it was known it actually folded down um you it collapsed that's it so you could open it up you put supplies in it you can see on there we have a, um, a don and a sugar pack some folding stretches that you can see and then the use of the toggle rope so that was either pulled or pushed by the medics themselves and that was how they moved a lot of their equipment we could quickly crack on and then of course you have um, what else have you got apart from the lack of transport you've got the MediRaid solution the the mark one uh, leather personnel carrier the boots so as you can see these are the medics um, some of the equipment was given to them and said here you go uh, this is yours so as you can see this guy here has got an entrenching tool um, on, he's got his small pack but he's got a first aid have a sack on top of it that's right Paul the uh, on the right hand side you can see he's got a, a large water bottle as well that would have been used for patients and the ubiquitous toggle rope round him and then in the right hand side You've got a guy, he's got an, the, the specially developed airborne folding stretcher and a blanket wrapped around him as well. And you can just about see, um, I can see it, um, round the back of his small pack, you have some crammer wire splinting that you would use to support broken legs with. It's just like thick wire that's cut down and put in the side the plaster of Paris or just wrapped round in a bandage to give support to um, broken limbs. Go I'll ahead, just jump in there, Neil, because you yeah. are going to address later on, because that guy there has got a, uh, a a pistol. He has got a holster. We will address yes. later yep. on the yes. armed or not armed role yes. of medic, because it has come up in other talks this week. It's it, we'll, we'll get to that in due course. These are obviously, these were training photographs um, taken, obviously, in the UK, blah, blah, blah. And this, um, uh, so as you can see, we've got an, a medic in, on the uh, left-hand side in jumping order, that was an extra 53 pounds worth of stuff. Uh, and then obviously after landing um, and collecting some stuff, this is actually meant to be, if you blew this picture up, you could almost say that the middle picture is meant to be a medical officer, which is probably why he's not quite so um, um, well loaded. But he's got, as you can see, round his neck, he's got his toggle rope. Um, he's got uh, between his two ammo pouches, he's got um, an Orilux lamp um, webbing container and stretcher slings around his neck. Um, the Orilux lump was obviously the British equivalent of the German, uh, sorry, the American right angled torch yep. that you will know an ubiquitous with the green colored one, but that was the British equivalent. And then if you look, this is, as I say in this one, this man, he's a lucky man here because he's got a lot of room on his back. Um, um, yeah, good one. So you can see, um, Got a few bits of kit there with his toggle rope and so on, but he's got plenty of room to be carrying other equipment on his back. 
Um, so it was the Mark I personnel load carrying um, person, basically. And here we are again, um, medical officers um, and NCOs, et cetera, et cetera, all sort of fitted out, ready to go, give you some idea. Majority of the stuff, obviously, was a bit bulky and heavy to carry. So that was why you needed the airborne um, collapsible trolleys. Uh, and that, and that basically, all the airborne equipment or most of the airborne equipment was kind of lighter and more foldable, compact versions of the stuff everybody else was using. The stretchers fold up. The you know, the, yeah. it's not that there's anything big being particularly invented for airborne. It's just it's a cut down version. It's like the jeeps had the bumpers cut off, things like yeah. that. It's just they take what they exist they had already and just adapted it for the role of airborne. Yeah, I was going to sort of touch on that is um, in a few slides time, but I don't think I've got it. But um, they invented for it. But some things they certainly did invent was um, a lightweight aluminium operating table. OK. Um, and one guy jumped. Uh, the chief clerk of 16 at Arnhem jumped with that in his kit bag. Wow. Well, one of the two that they took. Um, as it turned out, they weren't really needed, but we'll come into that uh that later again you can see Cranmer wire sprints he's got his small pack but on top of it is what was known as the first aid haversack um which we occasionally called the godfrey bag for want of a better word from godfrey from dad's army from dad's army yeah yeah he's got like a few safety pins and some cr um bandages and so on and so on in them um yeah if we could crack on now we come to uh this is the real meat um the real bones, if you like, of how the kit was dropped to them. This is what was known as the CLE container, the central landing establishment. Um, obviously, for the um, uh, for the fighting troops, for want of a better word, these would be full of ammunition, rifles, whatever, whatever, whatever. But the medics, obviously, these were slung underneath the aircraft as well. Um, so as you can see in this one, you've got Thomas Splints, Sorry, uh, that that bit uh, down a bit, that's it, up a bit. That thing with the sort of, uh, that's it. That's a Thomas splint used for treating fractured femurs. Um, but you've got Don and Sugar packs in there, comforts packs, a first aid medical ham, um, first aid haversack right at the top, blankets, folding stretchers. And can you go, yeah, um, I was going to say, if you get, went, uh, that way, that way, that yeah. it, you got the water bottle again. So these were the things, that, and these were carried underneath the Dakotas. Um, so they would, in theory, land pretty close to where the guys had gone. Hopefully in one of them, you'd find a, a couple of um, collapsible trolleys so you could get all your equipment together. And obviously with the medics were actually allocated um, their own planes um, so all of the sections should land together and then RV, you know, RV round the um, containers, get the kit sorted and then go to your own rendezvous point. Yeah. And for those watching, uh, for most operations, the parachutes were, were color coded. So you and it would change per operation. So for one operation, it might be blue would be ammunition, red would be medical, green might be um uh, medical, well, you know, um, yeah, engineer yeah. supplies or something, and and then they change each time. So that's that's so that when you're you you are there on the battlefield and you see a parachute come down, you know by its color what it's like you'd have underneath it. In theory, in theory. Okay, we can crack on to the next slide. So this is something that the boffins came up with, and they called it the dom pack, the dressing pack, and this in theory held enough supplies for up to ten patients' dressings. So as you can see in there, um, this again is something that Paul alluded to. But in here, they came up with what this this pack actually contained 56 compressed three inch bandages. So they compressed the bandages down for space saving. Um, and again, compressed triangular bandages, you know, the, the triangular bandage, which was the all singing, all dancing. You can always use a triangular bandage for virtually anything in the British Army. Uh, and you have things in this like field medical cards, which you can just see uh, yeah, at the back there. Those are the, we'll, we'll talk more about the field uh, medical cards. Some more Kramer wire splinting, um, then morphine tablets, anti tetanus serum, a tin of safety pins, and also what they called com some comfort items. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there were things in this pack like meat extract, candles, 50 cigarettes, and a box of matches. Yeah. Um, we will move swiftly on to the next slide, if we may. The sugar pack. So, 
the sister pack, literally, of the uh, Don pack was the sugar pack. Uh, and that held enough supplies to carry out 10 operations. Uh, um, and why the name? The, why sugar pack? Why? I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. Because it started with an S. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, that's what I was thinking. Is it just kind of, it's easier to say than surgical? Is it a derivation of, of surgical? I don't know. Just... I don't know. But they all, we, we knew them well. The medics in World War II called them Don and Sugar Packs. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this one had things like it, uh, plaster of Paris, uh, compressed bandages again, operating gloves and soap, uh, and also pentanol and chloroform, sterile swabs and scalpels. So you sort of the things that you wouldn't, you would need to do just a general basic operation. Um, and that, again, if you go on to the next slide, Paul, that just is it. And they were all marked when that, that kit was put in one of those haversacks and they were marked S and D. Just for each. So rather than rather than drop it loose and scabble around to try and find everything, it would be we've got four sugar packs and four Dom packs. And these, believe it or not, were actually used right up until the 1960s by the airborne medics. So they stood the test of time. Um, well, now then, this is another little interesting one, I think, uh, for everybody. Um, back to the Mark I mover. Uh, what every Mayor medic um, was meant to carry in his Denison smock was worked out, depending on his rank, whether it be a private, a corporal, sergeant or a medical officer. So this is what a sergeant was meant to have in his um, smock and webbing. Um, so if we go on, I'm sorry, just want to zoom out, Paul. I mean, I won't talk too much about all of that because the next slide will hopefully illustrate it, but that's what the guy, and that came out to about 30 pound in weight that he was carrying. So, you know, everybody said, oh, the medics had an easy time. Often you find that the medics were some of the most heavily laden guys on the battlefield. Um, yeah. that was why the trolleys were important. So, if you like, this was um, a medical sergeant's equipment. So as you can see, if you want to blow it, if you can blow it up, so as you can see, inside his pocket, he was meant to carry some of the forms that he used for treating, shell dressings, uh, what to carry in his pouches, um, cat gut, syringes. Um, interestingly enough, a tin of, there we are. What, have you, what do you see there, Paul? Just above your tin vulcanite with 10 cigarettes. Cigarettes, yeah. You see, there's a common theme going through this. Safety pins again, bandages, et cetera, et cetera. And he, that also got a first aid haversack. So that was what he had to carry. Uh, about about 15 pounds of sugar before he's even started with, um, you know, water ammunition anything else and he's got to walk the eight miles and start work or whatever 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 so that was what these were all laid out for every single man in the unit be it a private a corporal or whatever so they knew roughly what um what they needed to pack i suppose would be a want of a better word in the and it, is, it is i have to say it's very well thought out isn't it yes. they, they have they, yeah, every everything that guy needs is on that list for burns yes. for breaks for, for for tetanus uh pain everything is there yeah. i mean it's it, the guy is a walking you know pharmacy he's a, he's a doctor surgery yeah i mean bearing in mind it's a sergeant so in theory he's going to be what would what was known in those days as a nursing orderly class one you're quite right that's a lot of stuff packed into a smock but you've got to bear in mind that he also uses ammo pouches yeah. yeah, if you look right basic, left basic. And I suppose also, Paul, it's another, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I suppose I should apologise here. Should I say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? I don't know what you're supposed to say these days. No, yeah. Everybody. Anyone who's watching, we're everybody. an all-inclusive channel here. Whatever anybody. gender, nationality, race, creed, religion yeah. you are. Um, in theory, if the guy got um, out of action and he was a sergeant, you could nick his webbing and you'd know exactly what was in it. I have a good idea what was in it. But you're right, Paul. It's like he is almost like a walking dispensary, isn't he, of himself? Yeah. And he can treat and also, don't people. forget, they're, they're wearing a smock over the top of a battle dress blouse. There's there's four more pockets in the battle yeah. dress blouse. There's two shell dressing packet, pockets on your trousers and your yeah. pocket on the front and your yeah. knife pocket. And yeah. you've got the two internal pockets on the yeah. Denison, the four external pockets. And, of course, 
there was that bit at the back. You could cut into the double folded bit and make the poacher's pouch at the back yeah. under your ass to put in your jumpers or soft gear in there. So, you know, in my and old so days, two, two ran days, out, you can get a lot days, of gear in Denison Smart. Yes, two two days rations as well, certainly issued at Arnhem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, should we crack on, ladies yeah. and gentlemen? So, um, obviously, close to my heart because I know this um, quite easily, but this is the airborne evacuation chain. Uh, point of wounding, regimental aid post, collected by section, main dressing station, which was very similar to the first bit of the normal evacuation chain, but, of course, they can't go any further than the main dressing station because, say, for example... Uh, at Normandy, they were all right. They were only five miles potentially from the coast or so. So potentially they're going to be able to evacuate casualties on that day. But at Arnhem, for example, which is, um, yes, always room for more cigarettes, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, you'll, we'll come on to that, my friend, Mr. Carr. Um, <laughs> the main dressing station, 64 miles behind enemy lines at Arnhem. That was the, the worst operation. Ryan crossing 10 miles or so, but you're relying on the ground troops coming up to be able to evacuate casualties. So therefore, the main dressing station, the MDS, now became key in the casualty evacuation chain for the airborne medics. Um, so we've done some of the problems. Where are we going to get the men from? And basically, the first one, the 16th parachute ambulance, they relied on volunteers. Um, for those of you that weren't in, been in the forces, uh, certainly the army, um, the units used to do what was known as part one and part two orders. Um, part two orders was like the unit ones to say it will be sports afternoon on Wednesday. Corporal Smithers has now been promoted to sergeant, but part one orders would be things that have come down from above. And certainly uh, uh, in part one orders that went to every single medical unit in the UK was we are forming a parachute um Unit, will you like to volunteer? And some of the men stepped forward. I know Jeff Stanners, I'll mention his name later. Met him many times, a really, really nice guy. Uh, he was in a ground-based unit. He hated it. He wanted to get out. He actually volunteered to try and be an air gunner in the RAF. And they said, no, you, you can't do that, but we'll send you to the parachute unit if you like. So he did. So in 1941, he went to um, Hardwick Hall, as it was, which is where the unit formed up, which was where obviously the, the um, they did their World War II equivalent of P Company. So as well as the appeal, there was a poster, and of course there was the added attraction of getting a shilling a day parachute pay. Yeah, which is pretty much every veteran I spoke to said that was the big temptation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's quite a nice poster, as you can see, um, um, and the guys they never really were short of volunteers, although they did press gang people, as we'll come on to a little bit later on. Um, so um, other airborne medical units were converted to airborne ones by being what I call specially selected. So 133 parachute field ambulance um, originally started as 133 uh, field ambulance. There'd been a T-war, uh, pre-war TA unit from Croydon. Uh, just outside London, part of the 44th Home Counties. And I've realised we've put Davidson there, a mistake that I never spotted. Got Davidson instead of division. So I'll apologise profusely, ladies and gentlemen, there. Um, and after LA Main, it was told it was being converted to an airborne one. Some of the guys left, um, but others stayed all the way through. But there were, uh, by the end of the war, less and less originals, for want of a better word. Um, and that was also followed um, by conversion for 127, 181, who we've mentioned, 195, 224 and 225. Uh, they were all basically converted um, with use, re relying on a nucleus of men from the original units. And as I said, each airborne infantry unit had a medical officer and up to 18 orderlies attached, which helped in their regimental aid post. And then other units, say, for example, the 22nd Independent Parachute Company, the Pathfinders for the 6th, they had five uh, medics. They didn't have a medical officer, but they had five medics and so well, on. And, and it's so worth, it, worth at this point, Neil, mentioning the word medic, because the word medic wasn't used by the British originally. It was the nurse orderly. We kind yeah. of borrowed that from the Americans, and now it's accepted that we totally yes. call across medics across the board. But it, it's an American term, isn't it? Yes, indeed. And they were, um, I mean, certainly in some of the films, you will see them called orderly. 
Yeah. That was what they were called. They were called NOs. Nursing. In, in, days in, the, in days of the glory, the 1946 Ireland yeah. thing, they call they call out orderly, don't they? They do indeed. Yes. But in in, in later in Bridge Too Far, I'm sure they probably call out medic if anyone because that's just the, the change of language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, so apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for using Davidson, but we used orderlies on there. So anyway, sw moving swiftly on, I shall go and give myself press ups later when this is over. You do I'm it. In that, yes. Um, and then obviously the transport situation was re until relieved by the ground troops. The airborne medics relied on the fitted for stretcher jeep for transport. Uh, and also the Mark One, as we say, lever personnel character. Although I will say this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, stretcher humping, as we used to call it, is hard work. Um, you try carrying somebody who weighs 14, 15 stone for a mile. Um, it's hard work. But um, that was the good thing. The, um, the Americans, those wonderful friends from across the Atlantic, came up with the Jeep, the general purpose vehicle. Um, we decided to use it. And by, uh, as Paul has said, um, by a few alterations, it was able to get in the horse a glider. And each medical unit was allocated a number of these which came by a horse or glider, be they air landing or parachute. Um, and as you can see, there's a picture on the right hand side taken from um, the airborne medical mock up in Oosterbeek at one of the reenactors. My um, old mate from Essex there, Nobby Clark. I go yes. back with 30 years or something with Nobby. Oh, you mean Nobby who lives in Braintree, my friend? South I End, South End. Yeah, South End. Anyway, well, Prittle, uh, though, very just to digress, but... ladies and gentlemen, I mean, strictly speaking, that what they are doing when that vehicle is actually probably against the Geneva Convention because the, the vehicles that are marked for medical use and gain the protection of the Geneva Convention need to be permanently marked, like the example on the left-hand side. Yeah. I just digress because 46, you see the 46 on the rear bumper, that off the top of my head is the number for the light regiment royal artillery yeah i think so yeah but that but that illustrates the fact that they were pressed into service and yes that, that ability to, to to convey wounded became a uh well we're going down a rabbit hole of our yes, what went yeah. wrong with arnhem but in the end artillery obviously wasn't always where it wanted so jeeps that were there to tow artillery ended up becoming used by the medical personnel because yes. that was of a higher priority but that's yes. that's as far as we're going to go down that rabbit hole yes, I, think. I think so let's crack on um, and again, here we have um, the ubiquitous medics jeep, pretty for stretchers. You could actually put three stretchers cases on it, two at the back, one across the bonnet. And you can see here that they have fixed a permanent one to the front wheel uh, and also one on the windscreen as well. And I suspect there's probably one on the bonnet. But of course, with the guy on the stretcher, can't you yeah. can't really see it. Uh, that picture was taken in Normandy. So just a quick, yeah, that's fine, Paul. Just a quick one there. So uh, those units that we briefly mentioned were spread out amongst the um, the divisions, 16 and 133, 181 in the 1st Airborne Division, 224, 225 and 195, and then in the 2nd Independent Parachute Brigade, 127 field ambulance. And the idea was that um, basically it was one field ambulance was support of brigade. So 16 supported the 1st Parachute Brigade, 133 the fourth and so on and so on and then just to I'm, i apologize that there's a lot of terms in here but to me this is a, a field ambulance is not an ambulance that drives cross country it's a name described to use a mobile medical unit that treats wounded soldiers very close to the combat load uh, it, 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 it came up earlier in a week it's you could kind of describe it as a mash almost it's a similar mobile mobile yeah except of caregiving. course the, the field ambulances are not normally scaled for surgery yeah um you could almost argue that uh, our equivalent of a mash is almost a ccs a casualty clearing station which is normally tented and eight miles or so behind the front line um but anyway field ambulance normally as i said one infantry brigade and one section supporting each battalion um mm. there was usually four sections in a field ambulance, about 200 all ranks with a number of doctors and a dental officer, but no surgeons. That, of course, is a ground-based field ambulance. So if we crack on. 
And I'm just being, I'm showing off that I did three years of Latin at school. Ambulance comes from ambulare, the Latin word meaning to move about. So it's, yeah. we think of word, the word ambulance associated with the vehicles we hear go woo woo down the streets. But of course, its original meaning is, is mobile. It means moving about. Because the idea is a, a field ambulance would obviously be aimed to be sort of a mile, mile or so behind the front line. And if the front line moves forward, you need to move as well with the front line and so on. Everybody else. Yeah. Uh, Moves forward. So, um, a PFA, parachute field ambulance, skeleton outline for want of a word. I apologise. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of words in there, but in a big handfuls, a headquarters who ran the MDS um, with one of the sections and three sections going out to one of the the uh, three battalions in the brigade. Um, six officers, thirty five other ranks in the MDS. Although that will be reinforced by one of the sections to have extra manpower, so another 20 men into the MDS. 20, 20 to the sections who are going to move the casualties from the regimental aid post to the field, the main dressing station, and then a number of other attached personnel, as you can see. Um, a Royal Engineers, one sapper, believe it or not, and his job was to make coffins and repair the stretchers. Um, the service corps to drive the vehicles. These vehicle, the the unit did have a number of vehicles, but obviously the majority of them, certainly at Arnhem and at Normandy, came in what we would call the seaborne tail. Yep. So when the unit was relieved, they would because the idea of airborne forces is, um, I'm sure many of you are aware at Normandy, for example, um, and I'll touch on it later. They fought on as ground troops until September. So you needed the ambulances because you're you've you've gone once you're on the ground in theory you've gone from an airborne unit and relieved should I say you've gone from an airborne unit to a normal ground based field ambulance and you need to have your own transport obviously so there was the uh, the the drivers uh, there was a dentist and one other rank to look after the men's teeth he often acted as an anaesthetist as well the dreaded physic PTI to keep you fit and the order shop comic caterers to do the cooking. So these are just um, just to give you an idea again of um, what a guy might look like um, uh, once he's on the ground, um, devoid of all his uh, parachute finalia or a landing paraphernalia. Um, and that's the classic Demerson smock, isn't it? Enough yeah. said. And there's that nice colour image there of the yes. um, the pouch oh, for the, uh, yes. the, the light, the yes. lamp. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Moving on. Ah, oh, now we come to the classic. This was quite a popular um, item to volunteer to carry, and it was known as the medical comforts pack. Um, and as you can see, it's um, it's got uh, it came with such good nice things as a paraffin stove and paraffin meat extract. Uh, brandy, for example, those that metal flask has had brandy in them, uh, corkscrew can opener, meat extract. And if we go to the next slide, please, this is one that I really like showing to people. And then one of the most essential items in the comfort pack, five tins of 50 cigarettes. I yeah. think in these days of health and safety, uh, something would not be included today. But you've got to realise, I think it's a different world back in World War Two and nearly everybody smoked. Um, and that was often what the wounded were given. If they couldn't be treated, whatever, they'd be given a cup of tea and a, and a fag. And there's tea in that. that that's tea. That, just to point that's yeah, tea ration there. there. Tin, tin of, uh, tin of um, tea. Find these are the tins of tea. That's if tea there. Over, yeah, that's the meat extract, and there are 10 tins of tea. No, that's a that's tea ration there, definitely. There, well, uh, yes, that's the tea. But also, I know oh, that... that um, um, the, the chief doctor at uh, Arnhem, Warwick, recorded in his diary that 181 smuggled an entire tea chest of tea onto one of the gliders, which was about, I don't know, but do we see tea chests anymore? Good guy. Uh, yeah, they're only in I'm skiffle sure. bands. Skiffle yes, bands at the I'm base. Sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Plastic string. Yeah. Uh, but I think it held something ridiculous like 50 pound of tea. Just, uh, just while we're on the subject, the question just came in. I'll do it while it's there. Did the British mark medical staff helmets with a red cross? And generally the answer is no, isn't it? But occasionally... I was going yeah. to agree with you, no. Um, you, you, uh, you see it occasionally with Canadians with the, yeah. with the turtle helmet in infantry. I've... 
And you do occasionally see airborne helmets with a red cross, but I'm not sure if they aren't kind of post-war. I think they've been done by um, unscrupulous people trying to um, make some money out of it. Normally speaking, um, the airborne helmets were painted with a colour flash on the side. So, for example, you had a square that was divided into green and yellow for the recce squadron, yeah. the three-colour medics one, and so on and so on. But I have, in spite of... None of the none of the medics I ever interviewed from World War II said they had a massive red cross on their helmet. I've never seen any pictures from them, um, and I've never seen... Yes. But armbands, yes. Armbands yes. are kind of universal, yeah. 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 Um, and in fact, when we come on to some of the, the World War II photos, you will see... Um, see right. So, um, so apologies for boring you all to death with the uh, history and equipment. Now we'll come on to a little bit of action, as we say. Um, so February 1942, sure you're all aware, the raid on the German radar station on the north coast of France, Operation Biting, and um, some men from 181, which is somewhat surprising, really, because they'd only recently been an airborne unit since about October. Um, but I think um, they wanted to prove that everybody was ready. So rather than using 16 to go, they sent uh, 21 men a section one officer 20 other ranks went to went on the normandy uh, sorry the uh Brunaval raid um the idea was that they would land um and treat any casualties um and they were in the pickup party so they didn't go by air um they went on the ships and did land um some of them did land they treated seven casualties on the beach before drawing back to Britain. Um, there were only two photographs taken on the Brunaval raid, and I'm sure that you are aware of them. Both were of radar equipment before yep. the guy, Frost shouted at the guy, stop taking those bloody photographs, or words to that effect, or put that light out, because he was using a flash camera. Um, and this photograph was taken, obviously, when they came back. You will notice they are not wearing the airborne helmets had not got into 181 by then. So if you want to go up to their pool, just blow it up again. Can you see they're using the standard? Um, standard. Well, you will notice that a couple of them seem to have nicked Navy caps at the front as well. Yeah. Uh, but those were the guys from 181 um, uh, who went on the Brunaval raid. Um, so blah, blah, blah. Um, so, Schoolhouse, um, 1st Parachute Brigade, as I'm sure many of you are aware, went to North Africa in late 1942, uh, and 16 PFA accompanied them there, supported the brigade in North Africa for around six months hard and savage fighting. And, and I've uh, jokingly going to say to Paul here, the story of the brigade in North Africa is worth a talk by itself. Definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. I haven't I haven't yet done a North Africa week and I will do a North Africa week at some point. Well, there's an excellent book on the first parachute brigade in North Africa called Tunisian Tales. Do you happen to know the author? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, when the medics, they, they, they needed to find a suitable building. Um, don't always have tents. So they took over the schoolhouse at a village called Beja. And as you can see, they painted a red cross. Um, on the roof. This town was actually bombed uh, by the Germans on the 20th of November and left a large number of wounded civilians. Um, Lieutenant Robb, um, he was the surgeon, and Captain Wright, um, he was a section officer, but he was uh, he acted as the anaesthetist. Um, they performed 150 operations in that schoolhouse. Wow. Um, and whilst working during that period, a bomb fell outside the building again, wounding Lieutenant Robb, fracturing his kneecap, um, and his left tibia. And in spite of his injuries, he carried on working in the best traditions of the Corps, as I say in here. Um, and on the next day, donated a pint of blood as the supply of plasma was exhausted. So for his efforts during that period, he was awarded a military cross. So you don't always have to storm an enemy position to uh, win, a, win a decoration. Um, and it's also said by the other officers that I spoke to post-war, uh, you know, doing research that Lieutenant Robb's results as a surgeon were said to be the best ever by a parachute um, surgeon. It, and it turned out that he had um, worked as a surgeon at St. Thomas's Hospital during the Blitz before working, before joining the army. So it's probably, wow. he probably had a head start with all the Blitz casualties in 1940. Um, so 16 
mainly supported the well entirely supported the first airborne division first parachute brigade in north africa um and then as we know the they went to later on to serve in sicily and italy for returning to the uk in late 1943 and as you know there were two airborne divisions now and both expected to have a starring role in the invasion of europe but of course it was only the sixth airborne division who were chosen so in answer to, I think it was, was it Ian's question about, no, the guy from um, Canada. Um, as you can see, uh, yes, the Red Cross armband is uh, well in attendance. Um, and to make it official, they actually have to have a stamp on them, which says Army Medical Services, which unfortunately you won't see in this photograph. Um, the other thing I would um, quickly point out and if you could just zoom in on the left hand side of the screen please so first of all just to bore you briefly this was the first time that the invasion stripes were, were used the black and white stripes around the aircraft so you can see they literally were painted on with Room bricks um, yeah. and the other thing is you can see the medic here again how many of them are smoking the answer is nearly everyone um, this medic's wearing a life jacket and you can just see his pistol holder underneath it, believed to be 224. So these are chatting with their air crew just at RAF. I believe this was taken at RAF Har Harwell. And as if to illustrate your point earlier, you can see his denison smock is yes. bulging there with gear. I think he's got stuff in the poacher's pocket inside there. So, um, and he's, yeah, so you can tell how laden that they are. Yes, absolutely. Ah, so um, once on the ground, uh, suitable buildings obviously have to be found because you haven't got any tents. Um, and 224 shows uh, a farm um, not far from Ramville and Pegasus Bridge. Um, this farm is still there today. I'm sure you uh, you go you drive past it quite a lot, Paul. With uh, I do, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, although most visitors who go to it probably drive past it without realising because it's well hidden from the road. Yeah. Um, so that was a picture there. Can we go to the next one, please? And again, I apologise for the sm the, the uh, pretty nasty quality of this, um, but it's a rare photo. It's one of the only photo I've ever seen of um, the MDS of 224 at Lemazil. And as you can see, three casualties on the Jeep there. Um, and also, it's obviously they've had the link up because in the background you have got... Um, a crap at or ground-based ambulance for want of a better word so there if you like is the uh, the difference between the airborne medics and a ground-based unit the ground-based unit have nice ambulances that you would come to recommend at the back and then the medics have got a jeep yeah um so we'll just crack on so this is the farmhouse again um and in the grounds if we could go to the next one paul as well there is a plaque um behind glass um, which says uh, basically the main dressing station of the third parachute field out of uh, parachute. I do apologize, was established in these farm buildings from D day to D plus 13, during which time 112 major operations were carried out and 822 serious casualties treated. And the build which is, is amazing, isn't it? That, they are insane, those figures, yes. aren't they? Yes. You're looking at, and, I mean, that's right. not, and that's not the three months. That's just D Day plus two weeks. That's that. That's yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, amazing. And um, by the way, the Canadians watching, there would have been Canadians treated there because that was Third Brigade. So you know, the first Canadian parachute battalion, they'd have been taken there. So there is a Canadian connection to that particular field ambulance. Um, as I say, and this is, um, I would imagine that this plaque is probably one of the least visited in Normandy. Yeah, and I was going to stress, it is private property. That oh, yes, you yes. Have to, you, you can, the owners are accommodating, but you have to kind of contact them in advance or not, you know, it's it's down a private track. So, yes. But, um, yeah, if you make an arrangement to go there, they are very accommodating, but you can't just turn up there with a busload of people and expect to get a great no, welcome well, because it's I private. Don't, and, you won't get the, and you won't get the coach down there anyway. No. So before we move on, could you just go back one? Yeah. Uh, um, so... On that plaque, it says something like uh, the field ambulance itself lost four officers and 63 other ranks, which is a bit when you say lost, that is actually killed, missing and wounded. So um, they weren't all killed. But even so, that is still in the field ambulance, a 37 percent approximate casualty rate. So a third of the unit has been lost in 13 days. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, yeah. So, as I sort of alluded to, uh, I'll try to point out earlier, the last of the airborne medics, um, sorry, the, the, yeah, the last of the airborne medics from the 6th Airborne Division didn't get back until England until the 7th of September, 1944, uh, back in barracks that full day. Um, during the 77 days that the 6th Airborne Division um, had been engaged in Normandy, a total of 7,132 casualties were admitted by the three field ambulances of the division. So it's about, a th um, what is it? That's about a, just under 100 a day in, in simplistic terms. Um, not all were airborne warriors, um, but the majority were. And just to end this brief subsection, a few more numbers. So six airborne division casualties, admission to medical facilities and including the killed, missing, and, and killed and missing, 293 officers and 4,557 uh, other ranks, giving 4,580 men from the 6th Airborne Division went through the medical facilities of their division in Normandy. 4,850. Yeah. They also... Yeah, they also treated 101 officers and 1,781 other ranks from other British formations who were probably in the area and just happened to be brought there. They also treated four officers and 38 other ranks from the Royal Netherlands Brigade who were fighting in uh, Normandy. Uh, three German officer prisoners and 284 other ranks, 287, and also 62 French civilians given a total so um that's where the seven odd thousand come from and as i said the division itself suffered four thousand eight hundred and fifty casualties including one thousand one hundred and seventy killed so obviously as you can see it the six airborne division definitely needed a period of rest and recuperation before they would be fit um to take part in future operations so there is no way they could have gone to arnhem realistically um, yeah, anyway. definitely, and it's worth mentioning, although it's a bit of a side, a side rabbit hole again, that 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 the yeah the third parachute brigade on the James Hill, he went back with a third of his men. You know, he lost two thirds yeah. of his men in Normandy. So yeah, they they had been sitting on that ridge, holding that eastern flank for three months, and yes. uh, we tend to focus too much on Pegasus Bridge, Merville Battery, and the excitement of the first day at the expense of the next three months of just sitting on that same area and trying to stop. Yeah. And nobody was, we weren't moving. The Germans weren't really moving. It was just a holding operation, but it's overlooked. And uh, uh, we should cover that in future shows. Neil Barber, of course, talks about it a lot in his books, but we will do a show at some point about the British airborne holding that ridge for three months. I think it'd be a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. We can crack on. Um, right. We're so, up to Arnhem. Yes. Um, more of a training photo, but I've called it loading for Arnhem 44. So as you can see, a ubiquitous shot of a Jeep being loaded into uh, a horse or glider. But more to illustrate the point that um, the two field ambulances at Arnhem had six Dakotas each, 12 parachute aircraft. Um, they also were allocated six gliders each. So they took in six Jeeps each, um, six, six Jeeps and trailers, four 350cc motorcycles, um, this is 16, and 525cc um, motorcycles, 133, again, 10 parachute aircraft, six gliders, six jeeps, six trailers, two 350cc motorcycles, and three um, 125 motorcycles. Um, and then, obviously, 181 Air Landing Field Ambulance, obviously, as their name sound, they've had more gliders. They actually had 12 gliders allocated to them and they took eight Jeeps and four trailers and five 125 cc motorcycles. So in total, there were, for Arnhem, there were 12 parachute aircraft, 24 gliders, 20 Jeeps and 16 trailers. And just in the three parachute units, sorry, the three um, airborne units, 31 officers and 371 men approximately because numbers are in. but there were in total about 600 medics who went to Arnhem because you need to add in all the ones who were allocated to the infantry battalions anyway let's quickly crack on so apologies for this the world famous shot um, that I'm sure many of you have seen um once they landed the three parachute battalions uh, the first parachute brigade went off on their tasks 
the air landing brigade was going to act as the security force for the next lift um, but, and the majority of the headquarters and the support troops stayed around the Renkham, Renkham and Wolfhazer area and 181 had to send set up what was known as the divisional main dressing station and 181 set that up in some houses in Wolfhazer on a road called the Dootsie Camps Beg. Um, this was only a temporary location as they were meant in the medical plan to move later to Arnhem um, and occupy the municipal hospital. This famous shot that is used in nearly every single documentary on Arnhem to illustrate wounded or fighting at the bridge was actually taken outside number nine Dootsy Camp Beg. You've got George Cormack on the left uh, and John Ireland on the right. Um, I'm going to show my age here now. George Cormack. Um, met him a few times and he was actually an entertainer and professional dancer in Civvy Street post wow. very much for an airborne warrior and he actually took taught Danny Kay how to uh, do Scottish dancing for one of his films but well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a rabbit hole there isn't there wow. yes Danny but no Kay, one's yeah, probably yeah, ever wow. heard of Danny Kay but anyway that house um is still there today the, the doors are still there the same and if you ever drive down the Dootsie Campsburg it's number nine and on the gate posts, and I've, they are Dutch, and I've never really wanted to argue the point with them, but on their house are three words, and they are Het Uda Veld Hospital, which means the old field hospital. But I don't want to argue the point with them because it's their house at the end of the day. Yeah. We can quickly move on. So we spoke briefly about field surgical teams, and this is, and normally speaking, uh, the idea was that one uh, unit would work and the other one would be at rest. Because believe it or not, that was the other thing is you can't, doctors, surgeons cannot operate 24 hours. Well, they could, but then they need a period of rest, if you know what I mean. So the idea was that one team would do a 12 hour shift while the other one would rest and then swap over. So this uh, was again taken in the Dootsie Camps Veg, and this is the so called off duty uh, team of 181 on the same day, the 18th. Um, you've got the surgeon, Captain James, on the uh, right hand side with the traditional officer's hand on hips pose uh, you've got a padre there as well as you can see holding his helmet yes I don't think you can see a red cross on that but he certainly is uh, red and as I say out of this one two there's eight men in that photo two two of that photo would not survive to see England again and the other six uh, would not see England until 1945 Wow. Can you see, could you just zoom in for a moment? Because here's another good friend of mine on the, the yeah, the right uh, extreme left hand. Yeah, this, the, that guy there, George Aldred with the braces. Um, he lived in Luton, a very, very nice guy. I met him several times. And he, I remember one of the best stories he ever told me was that um, when they were working on this day, um, they brought a guy in who'd been wounded with a very, very nasty uh, abdominal wound and they found out that his intestines were like out of his stomach blown up by balloons so they did their best to sort him out treat him and George said to me he said you know he said I didn't think that guy would ever survive and we put the end up putting him in the p3 holding section the priority three um, they operated on him because they weren't that busy at the time if you know what I mean normally mm. speaking I think he would have gone to the back of the queue but George said he didn't think that um, the guy would survive the night and he, and he lost track of him. Um, and then he was on the going to Arnhem for the commemoration one year on the, um, the dreaded Harwich to the hook line. And he got talking to another veteran on the boat. And it turned out that was the guy they operated on. And he'd survived another 40 years. Brilliant. So small world and just allow a little personal story to uh, illustrate this. But uh, uh, if we wouldn't mind cracking on to the next one. Um, we're going to show you now, ladies and gentlemen, a few of the German photographs taken on the 20th of September. Um, again, one of the more you'll probably will have um, seen them, a lot of them. But I'm going to talk more about personal stories. Again, you can quite easily see the uh, Red Cross armbands on those um, there. If you could zoom in with the guy with the holding his face bow around his neck, um, two hands, please. That's the guy. Yeah. Um, so this is on the Utrechtsebeg, just down from the Skernord, MDS Crossroads, as we call it, in Oosterbeek. The guy uh, holding his face bow was my good friend Jeff Stannis. He had been in North Africa. Um, this is um, 
he'd been a member, he'd been attached to the first parachute battalion. So he'd already been in the through the fighting in Arnhem and now back in Oosterbeek on the 20th of September. Um, just zoom back out a minute. I'll come back to Jeff. I just want to say, you, if you notice, you've got a German Spinwagen uh, yeah. on the right hand side there. So the German, this was the time, um, a couple of days, well, the next day, if you like, this is the 20th. So the 4th Parachute Brigade was still struggling to get into the Oosterbeek pocket. And we hadn't really, the British had not really uh, garrisoned this road, which is why these photographs were able to be taken on the 20th um, of September. So look, if you don't mind, ladies and gentlemen, seeing as he was one of the one of the first airborne medics that I ever met, Jeff Stanners, I'm uh, going to say a few words about him. Um, after this photograph was taken, he smuggled himself back to, or was released by the Germans and went back to working in a medical facility. Um, his efforts at Arnhem did not go unnoticed and he was decorated in January 1946 with the Bronze Lion of the Netherlands by Prince Bernard at the Dutch Embassy in London. His citation was written by Major Denison of the 3rd Parachute Battalion. And I'll just bore you briefly, ladies and gentlemen, and read out his citation to give you an idea of what it was like to be a frontline medic at Arnhem. Lance Corporal Standards dropped with his field ambulance at Arnhem on the 17th of September and was employed as an orderly at a main dressing station from the 18th to the 25th of September. During that period, he chose the duty of carrying in casualties and searching for the wounded. Day and night, he moved around the lines of both forces, treating German and British wounded alike, often under heavy shell fire and wearing no other equipment than his uniform and his first aid bag. On one occasion, when German mortar fire was causing casualties, he went out to collect a wounded German SS officer and continued working in the open until he had carried four other wounded as well into his main dressing station. On the night of the 20th, 21st of September, he went through the German front line to an isolated British position where he treated the wounded and helped the worst cases back to the MDS. On many of his journeys, he received shrapnel wounds of varying severity until by the 24th of September, he had been hit in 37 different places. Good grief. He persisted in dressing his own wounds until ordered to have fuller attention when a dressing of his wounds by a senior superior officer lasted for two and a half hours. He could have walked across a road to regain his own lines at any time, but remained with his wounded and was evacuated as a prisoner of war into Germany on the 25th of September. Despite his wounds, he never ceased in the hazardous duty of looking for wounded and many men of both forces owe their lives to his devotion to duty and his great personal courage. Good grief. 37 times wounded. My God, what a, what a, what a guy. To, um, North Africa. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, he actually said to me, a mountain where they fought in North Africa called the Jebel Mansur was worse than Arnhem. Well, well, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> yeah. So again, apologies if you've seen this. Another classic shot of uh, from the Utrecht of Egg. This is a, a batch of walking wounded from an overspill facility uh, close to the dental surgery. Um, the other things I'd like to point out here is here's the field medical cards. Uh, that's it. The guy right. You can see two of them there, one under there. And that's so that is like their treatment card. So when they yeah. come in, they are documented to say you are one, two, three, four, five private smithers of the first border regiment. And you have a shrapnel wound to your hand. Um, and it will detail where he's wounded and what treatment he is being given. And when that gets up and obviously when he's treated again, um, it's all added to the card. So that remains with him when he goes through the casualty evacuation. It's basically, it's your patient notes that you have in hospital on a clipboard at the end of your bed. Um, we just zoom back out a second, please, Paul. Um, you wouldn't, can you, and then you'll notice just at the extreme left-hand corner behind the man, that is the, that is the signs that they were included in the packing equipment flags and they would be tied or attack, attack sign to show you that this is, so they could be turned round if you like, that's a triangle, so you would point to where the medical facility was. So that is, that's pointing to my right, yeah. so that means that's where the medical facility is, and obviously if it was and, that, and it's worth it's worth mentioning that, because when we had the question about, did they have marked helmets, and the answer is no, they did have lots and lots of ways of identifying yes. 
um, re- facilities that were a very regimental age post. So they, you know, you see it in the equipment these the reenactors have. They sort of follow those pennants and flags of varying sizes to put on vehicles, put on doorways, put on on fences, and so there's a clear t- intention to identify that this place is a place where aid is being given. Can I just can we just pause there and let me tell you another story that I hadn't intended to tell, but this is um, I've just thought of it while we've been going along. Um, Colonel Warwick, the chief doctor, he was a lot of the time based in Hartenstein. So those of you that have been to Oosterbeek, you know where the Hartenstein is, and it's about 200 yards from the MDS crossroads where a lot of the medical facilities were. Um, and he, I remember him saying that when he walked down there in the dark or often in daylight as well, he would walk down the middle of the road carrying a Red Cross flag um, on a pole um, and if he went at night, he would make sure he made as much noise as possible and shouted out arts, which is the German word for doctor, A-R-Z-T. And if he got challenged, he would often reply hull, as in arts hull. But I'll leave it there. <laughs> nice. Oh, you've got it. Yeah, you've got it. Yes. Let's uh, let's quickly move on to the next slide, Paul. So, um, again, roughly the same area. Um, the, the guy on the uh, the officer, obviously, with his shirt and tie and his Red Cross armband, that's uh, Sandy Flockhart, the dental officer. Uh, and they're obviously moving to um, seriously wounded cases. The interesting thing about this shot is if you just want to go in again, zoom, but over into the background for want of a better word. Other way, please, Paul. Can you see there is a, a stug there in the yeah, background? Stug, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you like, the medical facilities is now behind German lines, in theory. Um, this was the problem with Arnhem. The, the medical facilities weren't planned to be. Um, uh, they were planned to be in a um, uh, hospitals in Arnhem, but the plan didn't work. So they ended up in Oosterbeek as the stopgap. And as it turned out, the medical facilities were often beyond the front line, for want of a better word. So this was one of the rare occasions where in the British Army they had casualties evacuated forward. Mm. Uh, if you just zoom out, one more thing I think I'd like to point out. Can you just see by the bit of foliage uh, in the gutter an abandoned British airborne helmet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Often, again, as I said on last time, often the little bits are missing from these photographs. Thanks for that, a Stug 3. Um, one of the Germans, but there's um, the, the the German PK propaganda company guy actually went down to that because I know he took a couple of shots of those paratroopers or airborne uh, air landing guys who had yeah. surrendered to him over there. Um, but as you can see, this is right. Be- and this is a little bit further. Al- yeah, we can go on. Um, um, this is a little bit further along the road towards Arnhem. Um, and these are evacuating the guys. Now, the guy at the back of the stretcher yeah um there which looks like he's as you can see that is um the no the the, the guy smoking paul to the yeah, right there we are yeah that's frank Coloppi. His, his face you can see has just been obscured by a, a puff of tobacco smoke now you will notice that nearly there's quite a number of them were smoking there's at least two smoking in this photograph as i can see uh it wouldn't surprise me if there were some others um believe the guys in the back with the shrimp bargain again um, are from the Camp Group Muller, um, the German engineer support to the 9th SS Panzer Division. And just for the, anyone who's really interested into the um, medical um, wounding, for one of a better, the man on this stretcher that you can see that Frank Coloppi is uh, carrying has probably got an abdominal wound because he's, got his, he's in what we call the W position with his legs up because it takes the pressure off your stomach. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering what was going on there. Yeah, yeah. you've got your feet flat on the floor, uh, on the stretcher rather, and your legs up, and it takes a bit of the pressure off your stomach muscles. Um, but they're obviously being um, uh, marched off into captivity. Um, although some of the medics were allowed to return, but obviously some of the walking wounded who were helping carrying the stretchers obviously went, normally speaking, they went to the... Um, St Elizabeth Hospital, um, but we'll cover that um, um, a little bit further on. Uh, and I don't think, yes, oh, quickly. So um, 
often, not often that we say, we talk about Arnhem and a success, but I'm always proud to say this uh, when we, when I get a group going around Arnhem, that one of the bits of the uh, plan that did work was 16 parachute field ambulance. Um, they were meant to follow um, the second parachute battalion on Lion route and peel off and set up their main dressing station in a hospital known as the St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Uh, and that is one of the bits of the plan, few plans that did work. Um, this is exactly what happened. Um, by about eight o'clock in the evening of the 17th, they had arrived and the Dutch doctors there offered them space, wards, facilities and operating theatres. An absolutely ideal location, if you think about it. Um, and then that night, if you want to zoom back out again, I've just used this photograph for two reasons. Obviously, the, that night, the busload of Germans debussing in the entrance and was hit by the PIAC from Victor Dover's C Company of the 2nd Parachute uh, Battalion. Um, but the main reason I do that, the following morning on the 18th, um, John Batley, one of the medics of 16, who I believe is still alive. Well, he was the last time I spoke to him, which is only a few months ago. I haven't heard he's dead. Um, he hung that homemade red cross flag out of the window using a sheet um, he did tell me you use jam but i'm not really sure about that he certainly got something to make a big red cross flag out of it um, the hospital actually was overrun on the 19th and the majority of um, 16 pfa who were working there were marched off but the two field surgical teams and some other medics were allowed to stay and then other medics and um, those of you who have been to Arnhem know that there was a lot of fighting went on in the streets around here and yeah. some of the medics who were present um, were allowed to get into the hospital and were allowed to stay um, as I say I'm going to say this to Paul again the St Elizabeth Hospital area in Arnhem is worth a talk by itself um, and for tonight is enough to say that the last medics left here on the 13th of October, 1944, nearly four weeks after arrival. Yeah, I've, I took some footage there. I, I took some um, uh, when I was there in November of 2019 with Colin. We, we took some footage. I, I could do a show about Queen Elizabeth, and we took some footage. It's only just around the corner where Urquhart hid. It's just Absolutely. Up the road. Same, yeah, so uh, a lot to see around there. So I've got I've got footage I can use, or I could send someone like Edwin who lives nearby to go yeah. there and film for me, whatever. But um, can I just yeah. uh, can I just finish the Arnhem section with a few yes, numbers? Please. Um, exactly how many wounded the medics uh, treated at Arnhem will never be known with any certainty. But out of about twelve thousand men who went to Arnhem, two thousand four hundred came back. One thousand four hundred eighty-five ish were killed at Arnhem or died of their wounds in the coming weeks, which left around six and a half thousand as prisoners, and it is fought around three thousand two hundred of these were wounded. Three thousand two hundred wow. uh, in German care. Um, so these again, just a few more shots from the uh, the reenactors. You know. And they do a great job. I mean, Vicky Townsley, right, who's on the right there, is he's, he's currently at Chalk Valley History Festival doing his his, I think he's doing First World War, uh, surgeon there. But he he's he does a lot of great work talking to the public about the role. Brian Parfit, my friend there as well, and so the public can get to actually see, in a sense. Uh, what what was going on they see the equipment and they kind of carry patients in and they 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 do pretend the treatment of them it's very effective it's very it's very popular with the public before you go on i mean can i just say that uh, dickie townsend is obviously a legend in his own lunchtime because those of you that saw the dreaded awful program with gary lineker about his father in uh, italy yeah uh, and i'll say awful um, for the simple reason that Peter Caddick Adams started it by saying the medics were unarmed, and we'll come on to that in a moment. Ah. Um, but Dickie Townsend was in that talking about the role of the medics in the Second World War. And he's so also in 1917 at the end. He's in. The, yes, he's, he's, he's one of the surgeons operating in the big tent at the end of the yes. film 1917. So he gets around a bit, does Dickie? He does. Adams. He's a legend. In his, he deserves an Oscar. Yeah, I, I, I've known him since he was 15. I was about in my mid-20s. He was 15. I, and he's just a great, great guy. I've known yeah. him quite a long, long time now. And it's lovely seeing him um, yeah, become a really well-known um, living historian and, and indeed a historian in his own right now. Brilliant. Yes, let's crack on anyway. Um, so again, that's so uh, as you can see, there's uh, we go back one pool again. You see, there these are the, the panniers as well that were used by the main dressing stations, bought on the gliders. Um, cherry berry. Hit that like button. Um, anyway, uh, let's crack on anyway. Yeah. So let's move swiftly on to Operation Varsity, March 1945, the next airborne operation, the crossing of the Rhine crossing. Um, again, this subject is worth its own talk, but some of the failures from Arnhem 
were learned instead of being dropped round about 64 miles behind the um, uh, front line. Um, no, in front of the front line, 64 miles in German territory. It was about, only about 10, less than 10 miles, and the link-up was expected the same day. Um, the ground offensive, as we know, um, started just before the airborne drop. Uh, well, no, not before um, the previous day, not at about the same time, about 10 hours before the drop and the landings, one of the most successful airborne operations of the war. So there were no hospitals in the area, unlike Arnhem. And so uh, buildings were annexed for use. And this is a picture of the MDS of 195 who had taken over some houses near Divisional HQ. As you can see, it's just doing a bit of a blood transfusion there. Um, or a intravenous trip. I'm not sure it is a blood transfusion. Um, 224, for example, used the church uh, and took over the the vicar's house for its field surgical team, and 225 used the farm near the edge of their DZ. So again, it's like a case of finding a biggish building. And, and farms, schoolhouses, churches, those are the sort of things because you need the ability to, you can't, uh, uh, you can't just have a, in a well, you can have them in a house, but look at Kate to Horse House. She ended up with about 300 people in her house and the medics ended up walking on stretcher handles to get across because there was yeah. no room on the floor. You need space. You need to be on a, on a kind of a, a, a junction as well, crossroads or something for, 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 for movement. and, and Yeah, and you need to have – you basically an, – and an, an, an MDS normally has a reception, treatments, minor treatments, major treatments, and evacuation. Um, yeah, lots of space. Yeah. Let's crack on. So, um, casualty evacuation at Varsity using German prisoners. Um, so, as you can see, um, there's the medic, got his Red Cross armband on again. Um, we're using the Germans to bring in some of their wounded from Varsity. Um, stretchers, by the way, were not normally in short supply. Um, um, as each glider, regardless of its load, was meant to carry two. So somebody would go around all the gliders that had left on the uh, on the drop zone to pick up the two gliders. A PFA. Can we go to the next slide, Paul? Because I, I just want to point out again that guy yeah. is in the spot. He's got he's got his yeah. um, padded he's got out there. Big ass. Yeah, yeah, big ass. He's not, he hasn't got a big ass, folks. He's got stuff shoved inside. Does my bum look big in this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's again is the uh, the medic supervising on, I believe, is one of those dreaded airborne folding bicycles, which can sell for anything from around a thousand to five thousand pounds these days. Um, a parachute field ambulance was allocated 12 folding bicycles and an, arm, an air landing field ambulance, a massive 130. Although I know that I never heard of any airborne medic riding an airborne folding bicycle on operations. But obviously this guy did. Um, anyway, shall we crack on? So, um, just to it, you'll be pleased to hear, ladies and gentlemen, that we are coming towards the end. So, I just thought I would throw in a few things called airborne medical myths. So, these are the classic ones all the medics were unarmed, all the medics were either Quakers or conscientious objectors, and all the medics stayed behind at Arnhem when the evacuation happened. Airborne medical myths. So, if we could quickly go on, soon. so the medics were unarmed. The Geneva Convention allows medical staff to be armed for the protection of themselves and their patients. And as you can see, the official war establishment tables for a field ambulance includes the following. 123 pistols, 12 rifles and 31 Sten guns. Need yeah. I say any more? Um, obviously, that was their war establishment. Um, you would get you will get not everybody carrying a weapon, as I will come to. But there's the fact is that the medics were unarmed. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, Fred Budd from 181 Air Landing Field Ambulance in Italy. They say a picture paints a thousand words. I will say no more. It, both of them got a pistol. So they, generally speaking, with the, the, uh, the, the medics were normally given a pistol with the, the rifles and the stens being given to the drivers of the Royal Armed Service Corps. Um, so we go on to there. So why do you think there is the myth about them being unarmed? Is it just because it's nice? Is it a nice story? People, it, it somehow adds to this 
you know, angels kind of, you know, respect they have for them. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it is, you hear it all the time. People say, oh, the medics, because they were unarmed. And, yes. and there were, in some armies, there were medics who chose not to carry a weapon. But the, that was, I think, the exception rather than the rule. I think so. And I think the British Army have always been more aggressive, shall we say? I don't, I, it's, it's one of those weird ones because I think it's like, I don't know, I, it's, it's one of those things is I've no idea where it started. Um, but it just it's like a boulder rolling downhill yeah you know and i tell as many people as possible you know, just by showing photographs as i said someone said it right earlier so i think Shell Drake said it it's 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 protection of yourself and protection of your patients is that yeah you know, i mean very rarely do you get medics doing you know bayonet charges against any machine gun business. that's not well, what we're saying we're saying they're carrying a weapon for defense yes that's it. And um, you're quite within your rights. If an officer came up to me when I was serving and said, uh, Sergeant Terry, I'd like you to take you and your section and go and sort that wood over there. I said, I'm sorry, sir, we're all wearing red or red cross armbands and we're not allowed yeah. to do that. Yeah. Uh, and he can't charge me, blah, blah, blah. Um, this again is, I mean, how many, how many people have seen this photograph? I would suspect nearly everybody. Um, taken actually at the back of uh, where we were before with um, George Cormack, with um and the field surgical team in wall phaser yeah if you zoom in on it paul he's got midge mills um by the, the grave of truth redmond um and as you can see at this stage of the game he is clearly wearing a pistol holster yeah and we covered his story that the death of that trooper there was covered in the wolf hazer show from wherever that was september yeah. last year with joe hook and edwin popkin so go back on world war ii tv search ambush at wolf hazer and you'll have the story about how that photo came to be taken so all the connecting of the dots of the shows uh, in true world war ii tv style and it's got to be said at arnhem certainly that by towards the end of the battle the medics were ditching their weapons because it was such close quarter you know what i'm saying is they weren't yeah. in a safe area and they did rely on the protection of the red cross armband and flags uh, and then just to show it was happening in the six airborne division as well you can see two medics one, one of them smoking yet again you see there's he's armed with his wood capstan non-filter um but both of them have got lanyards around their neck and the, obviously you can clearly see that one of them is carrying a pistol and a four and a cold 45 by the way because he's got the yes. twin the yes. twin magazine pouch which is a very rare bit of british kit because we think of the british carrying revolvers but a few guys had either browning hbs or yep. in this case, I think a Colt 45, which you had to stretch. I'm going being a bit geeky. You had to stretch the holster in water to make the canvas big enough to accommodate the kind of the wider barrel of a Colt 45. But it would take one. Yeah, and those those twin pouches are, are like hen's teeth these days. Well, Although they make repos now, but the original ones, I mean. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say those three pictures, I think, paint a thousand words taken in three different areas of operation. Yeah. Yeah, good to have photographic evidence. So, yeah, now the conscientious objectors is, is a hot one because I think I've been guilty in the past of giving out misinformation about this. So uh, I'm happy to be corrected. So um, uh, hopefully these two slides will be of interest to you. So Quakers and conscientious objectors, yes, I will concede this point. But 1st Airborne Division, approximately 630 medics went to Arnhem of six, and there were six. So what's that, 1%? Yeah. Uh, and the six airborne, but in the six airborne division, there were lots more. So this is why I concede the point. But when you say lots more, what what do we know? What percentage? Oh, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, please. You know me; I cover all bases yeah, off. Yeah. Right. So regretfully, there isn't a great deal of information about the men in the one nine five field air landing field ambulance. But certainly, I'm going to stick by this in the parachute courses. So 158 men went through Ringway as conscientious objectors. Five went to 127, who served obviously in the Mediterranean mainly. Two went to 16 and three to 133, which is the first airborne division. So if you look at that, 80 to 224 and 53 to 225. So if you look at 224 being about 200 men, but it's let's call it 300 by the time you add in that's entire world war ii so you have losses but let's say around about a third a third, a third of two, yeah. two, four was a conscientious objector yeah and, the, and if any of you have uh, really really into it you can tell a conscientious objector because his number starts with a nine seven yeah someone just mentioned that uh, uh brad brad oh no it was 
Yeah, no, it's, Paul Reed said that they had the, the special numbers. So, um, no, so that's they, true. They have yes, a different number. Um, they would, they were at my good friend, Mr. Reed. They were allocated, they all start with the number 97, which was allocated to the non combatant corps. And there is certainly a guy at Ranville whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, but he is, he was a conscientious objector because he's got a 97 number. What's the truth? Neil, about the fact that if they were conscience objectors, they didn't get the same pension the other guys got. I was told that years ago by someone in Normandy, and it's one of those things I've never actually bothered to go and check out. Do you know if that's true or not? I've never been asked that question before, and I'm going to give you my answer when I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. It's, an, it's, a, I, it's, it's just shooting from the hip without any, any real basis and it's my own personal opinion i would have said no because they were in the british army well that's what i will I, I, that's where i was always confused because someone said because they were constant objectors if they had stripes it was an appointment not a rank and there was something that they weren't actually part of the british army they were in on some kind of loophole well, and they didn't get the pensions but or, or or their widows didn't get the pensions or something there was something i was told where the will, pension system research. was less fair for them than it was for other people but i again i, I confess I've theory, never to look into the it. conscientious objectors were not meant to be promoted so they weren't actually up as a corporal or whatever yeah. anyway but i hear what you're saying yeah if, if someone knows the answer to that and wants to fill it in if there's some there probably is someone out there who's a pensions expert within the british army who can say yes yes they were a different category or they were the same i could sit. so if you know that folks get in touch with either me or neil and we'll we'll we'll, we'll and also it. the other thing unfortunately is i i met many more medics from the first airborne division than the sixth airborne division and there were only six in the in the first airborne division. So me, the chances of me meeting one of them, yeah. and I didn't. Was I? I've, I've, I mean, obviously, I'm a Normandy guy. I've never met a conscientious objector veteran from the from the sixth airborne division. So, and again, I would wonder whether they would be joining the same kind of associations and going on the same trips if they were differently motivated. I don't know. I, 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 I have I've had many people talk go, about I how they were. They're the sort of people that wouldn't want to go back, to, in my view. Yeah, I'm, that's what I've, I've had people idea. say how great they were, but I've never met one. But again, I, I would, I could, I'd go and ask Mark Worthington at Pegasus Bridge Museum whether he's ever met any over the years. Because if a veteran's come to Norway, they've been through that museum. So I, I might ask him next time I see him. So has anybody signed the visitor's book with a 97 number? Yeah, 97 okay. number. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so, got, so here's the last myth. Um, all the medics stay behind at Arnhem with the wounded, as as portrayed by Sean Connery in the film A Bridge Too Far. And the truth is one officer and 30 other ranks came back. So about 5%, um, 95% casualty rate. I mean, I, I, I normally only included the units that where guys came back from, but I put 16 on there just to show you that nobody from 16 came back at all. Yeah. Three from one, three, three, ten from air one, eight, and so on, uh, and that's the thirty-one. Um, interestingly enough, the twenty-first Independent Parachute Company took five medics with them to Arnhem, and five came back. Brilliant, yeah. So, you know, um, and they of course weren't Jews, and they didn't have Scottish names. That, well, that's another that's another rabbit hole for another show, isn't it? Yes, Pathfinders it is. and and yes. and Jewish volunteers and stuff. Again, the difference that the twenty second independent parish can be in Normandy is a different system to the twenty first. But yeah, that's another subject for another day about the about the 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 the, the variety of people inside those units. But I'm not going to go. We're not going to go down that no. that subject today. We'll do that another day. Yes, right. So let's just, I think we're now coming on to the real end of that. So with the war over in all theatres, it's decided to keep only one air, British Airborne Division, the six, and the units in the air, first Airborne Division disbanded towards the end of 1945. Um, eventually, the Airborne Forces reduced that uh, um, only one medical unit was needed, and that was the 127th Parachute Field Ambulance, which had been with the second parachute independent parachute brigade in the Mediterranean and they became 23rd, 23 PFA, a number it retained till it was disbanded in 1977 when they disbanded the 16th uh, independent parachute brigade. There was, interestingly enough, still an airborne medical element after that, which was known as the parachute clearing troop, 
of 16 field ambulance, a, a sort of like the same number that there was used in the Second World War. Uh, and they went down south in 1982 um, in the Falkland Islands. And then as a result of the Falkland Islands, obviously, the government decided that perhaps disbanding the airborne forces or their support units wasn't such a good thing. And then 24 PFA was reformed after the Falklands, um, although they are now, uh, they in turn have been disbanded and they are known as um, 16 close support medical regiments. And one of their and their squadrons, believe it or not, are 16, 23, and 181. So some numbers there, a little bit of history going through. Yeah, a little bit of lineage there. I like I like it when they keep those traditions. So yes. well, yeah. Just a look, just a shame, a shameless bit of um non-publicity for myself. Um Red Berets and Red Crosses came out in 1998, I think. Um sold nearly three thousand copies now. Um, and if anybody, um, and I'm not forcing anybody to buy a copy, um, I've agreed with the publisher that this is the last time we're not going to ever reprint Red Berets and Red Crosses. And there are about 50 copies left in the bunker. Um, so once that 50 have gone, that will be it. That will be another book that you will pay fortunes. Well, and there is a link below in the description, folks, to, to buy that book. I didn't put a link into Arnhem <laughs> Surgeon, but yeah, I, I would recommend any of Neil's books because they're worth getting. And uh, there's some people who seem to buy every single book I ever recommend. Recommend. So I don't know what's happened to their libraries. I'll get I'll get sued for the damage to their floors of the weight on their shelves. But whatever, it's good. Um, so yeah, that's um, um, just the next slide, and I think it's called the end, isn't it? Yeah, and and yeah, as we said, because someone was saying that they want to contact you about some photos of the aid stations yeah, yeah. in um, in Varsity. So yeah, you're on you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook. The links are there below, and as we've said on many shows, it's nice to to, to continue links and create contacts and meet meet new people because none of us know everything. Uh, you know a lot, but I'm sure like everybody I'm else, there's, all the time. there's things I'm people can send you. There's information they can share, and and we, we like making contact with people. But it's good. So um. Brilliant well, stuff. I well, I hope I've bored you all to death, and that's an hour and a half of your lives that you're not going to get back again. I think people have really enjoyed it, Neil, and I've certainly enjoyed it. And you know, you you know how to present the story. You went through the the formation, the training, the equipment, and then went through the battles. And as we said before, we went live. Any one of these things we talked about, we could expand on. We could just talk about the role of the 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 uh, the, the, the the work in Arnhem. We could just talk about normally there's potential. If people like this show, we can go into more detail in a, in a future show. So there we are. So, um, well, um, as far as I'm concerned, I'll have are you back any you want. Are there any questions or have I blinded everybody? I think, well, someone just said that every time they think about asking a question, it comes up. The answer comes in the next slide. <laughs> so I think you've you've pretty much anticipated. But if there are any um, questions, Colin's off for a pint now. So um, right. you, you kept Colin's attention. I'm just going to say to me what we've got coming up tomorrow. And then I'll I'll come back and say goodbye to you. So, Airborne uh, Medics Week ends tomorrow, uh, folks, with my own presentation about Angavillo Plan. That's at two o'clock in the afternoon UK time. So before the Wales game, don't worry, you aren't going to miss that. We're going to be guiding you around the village of Angerville, talking about the 201st Airborne Medics, Robert Wright and Kenneth Moore. I'm looking forward to that. It won't be live footage because the, 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 the reception there is too bad and the weather's going to be terrible to look tomorrow. It's footage I took two days uh, yesterday. High definition footage of the drop zone on the village. That'll be great. Join me for that. Um, and then Battles at Sea Week starts next week. But right now, it remains for me to say thank you very much, Mr. Cherry, no, for joining thank us. You. Thank you for inviting me. Um, no, we, we loved you. Paul Reed loves you. Uh, Di Donnelly loves you. John Carey loves you. Everybody loves you. It's been a great presentation. What can you say? Checks in so, the um, <laughs> Good. Well, I'll let you try and go to the pub. And for those watching, don't forget to share what we're doing on social media. Don't forget to. Uh, uh, check out our Patreon page. Check us out on Facebook. Check Neil out on Facebook, Twitter. Um, Neil is a uh, uh, his account on Twitter is is underfollowed. Uh, it needs more people to follow him. And as for me, um, I'll be back with you tomorrow afternoon for Mangavilla Plans. So thank everybody for watching. Whoops! Thank you for watching. I will see you all tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Nick. Bye. Yo.